Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Tiger Gao. Uh, today joining me is Harold James. He is the Cloud and Laura Kelly Professor in European Studies and Professor of History and International Affairs at Princeton University. He is certainly one of the most prominent financial and uh, economic historians of our age. Uh, some of his recent books include Family Capitalism, which was published in 2006, uh, The Creation and Destruction of Value in 2009, Making the European Monetary Union in 2012, uh, and what I'm holding up right now, uh, if you are watching YouTube, you could see this, uh, The Euro and the Battle of Economic Ideas with Professor Marcus Brunemeyer and Jean-Pierre Landau uh, in 2016. And we're here to talk about his very most recent book published in 2020, Making a Modern Central Bank, The Bank of England, 1979 to 2003. It's a fascinating read uh, about central banking, about finance, about some of the most important pivotal moments and, and macro financial trends in the past few decades. So Professor James, Thank you so much for joining me today. Yes, it's a really great pleasure for me to be with you, Tiger. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Uh, Professor James, maybe we can uh, start off uh, right off the bat to talk about your, your most recent book. Uh, would you mind giving us kind of a brief outline of, of what you hope to achieve with this book? Sure. Well, in a sense, uh, you know, if you ask uh, what a book is about, um, I think it's always a good idea to try to encapsulate the fundamental thesis of the book in the title. And so in a sense, the title, Making a Modern Central Bank, is exactly what the book is about. Uh, so it's a history of the Bank of England from the 1970s uh, to the early 2000s. Um, in the 1970s, the Bank of England was really a pretty antiquated and odd institution, and it didn't perform well uh, by the metrics of how people would judge a central bank. Uh, the UK was uh, the country uh, among industrial countries that had, uh, with Italy, the highest level of inflation. I started studying in Cambridge University in 1975, um, and the level of uh, CPI, uh, uh, consumer price index inflation, in 1975 was uh, almost 25%. Um, by the early 21st century, um, the, there's low inflation in the UK and indeed throughout the world, uh, throughout the industrialized world and many big emerging markets uh, are also moving to a lower inflation environment. Um, the Bank of England has a clearly defined task in a way that it didn't have in the 1970s. Its functions are separated from those of the government um, and it looks as if it's doing very, very well. Uh, Paul Krugman uh, at that time uh, was saying how the Bank of England was uh, punching above its, uh, its, its weight um, because obviously the UK is not one of the largest countries of the world, um, but it's an important financial center um, and you know, everything looked looked really great. Um, and then 2007, 2008 comes and uh, it's, it's a real shock. And uh, many of the assumptions of the period that I'm talking about in this book get undone again. Uh, so one of the key moves that I'm thinking about is the move to central bank independence. And that was a move that took place all over the world. Um, but it's in the new legislation in the UK at the end of the 1990s. Um, after the financial crisis, it's, it's clear that monetary policy often has fiscal implications. Uh, and so then there's a demand, if that's the case, shouldn't there be greater political control over monetary institutions? And uh, what exactly is the line of separating monetary and fiscal policy? So the, 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 the basic conceptual framework that was devised in the 1990s um, looks as if it's suddenly redundant. And um, as countries get larger fiscal deficits and as debt levels build up, the question of debt management becomes central again. That was a critical issue for central banks in the interwar period immediately after the Second World War. And part of the reform in the 1990s is to take debt management away from the Bank of England. In the 1970s, the Bank of England was doing industrial policy. 
everybody thought that's an absurd thing for a central bank to be doing by the 1990s. After the financial crisis, it comes back again. And uh, it, how do you judge which, which assets a central bank should buy? Uh, isn't there some kind of um, uh, judgment about where the economy is moving, what kind of jobs are desirable to keep? Um, and then you get back into industrial policy. So all the old issues come back again. So in a sense, you know, this is the story of a, um, a, an intellectual revolution that uh, produced what looked like a very appealing result, uh, but where that appealing result then gets called into question. Perhaps to put things in, in perspective a little bit, the Bank of England was established by the Parliament, I think, in 1694. And you picked out this very particular period of time, which is 79 to 2003. So wh why did you pick this particular period? Uh, specifically, why, why didn't we go be, uh, before 79? What happened exactly in 79? And also, uh, why not in, uh, after 2003? W wonderful. Uh, <laughs> no, no, that's, a, that's a great question. Well, uh, I, I, I quite honestly, um, I'd have loved to have written a history of the Bank of England from 1694. Um, and the 1690s are absolutely fascinating because the model that the Bank of England then represented at that time uh, was was really unique and um, it's become the subject now of a uh, lot of study and a uh, lot of interest. It, it, it's really crucial to the argument uh, of um, uh, people like uh, uh, Douglas North and Barry Weingast about the institutional revolution at the end of the 17th century that creates the conditions of the modern world or Asimoglu and Johnson more recently, um, the, the idea that institutions matter. And, and what the creation of the Bank of England did, it was a mechanism for um, taking the debt, the public debt that was accumulated uh, as a result of fighting a very expensive war against Louis XIV. It took the debt, uh, managed it by a, uh, in a private corporation. And the corporation also had a degree of political power because it was also in practice the group that dominated the House of Commons, the legislature set the tax levels. And so it could always ensure that the debt was credible. And the result of that was that the cost of borrowing fell in Britain very dramatically compared to France. And so in the 18th century, um, that's the great geopolitical rivalry between Britain and France. Uh, France has a much, much bigger population, um, uh, more than double the population, uh, triple the population practically of the um, United Kingdom. Uh, but because it can borrow so cheaply, um, Britain is actually able to punch well above its weight. And so you know, that, 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 that was really the, the, the model. I would have loved to have talked about that. Um, but there are plenty of other books that, uh, that deal with that. And um, the Bank of England has had, uh, uh, since the uh, 1930s, um, a set of official histories. Uh, and the first of those official histories does indeed uh, start in uh, 1694 by the very distinguished British economic historian, uh, Clapham, John J. H. Clapham. Um, and then uh, that series has been continuously uh, added to. Um, the most recent volume before mine uh, was by Forrest Cappy, uh, and that stopped in the late 70s. And so I just start where uh, Cappy begins. And I end um, in the early 2000s uh, because basically, um, you know, this is a book that's heavily based on documents. Uh, and it's important if you write something like this, that the documents can be verified by other people and consulted by other people. Uh, so the British archival law is transitioning from what used to be a 30 year rule to a 20 year rule. Um, so in effect, up to 2001, um, all the material is publicly available and uh, the, the, the additional two years, it, it's, it's not really a big period in the history of the bank 2001 to 2003. 
Um, I stop well before the financial crisis. Um, I, I couldn't, uh, shouldn't have been given access to the documents, the internal documents about the financial crisis. Um, that's going to happen in the future, but that's too early at the moment. And so that in a, in a, in a sense explains this peculiarity of the book that's um, you know, leading to something. Um, we know what's going to happen, but it's in a way like a thriller. Um, you know, sometimes you don't need to see the murder actually committed. Uh, you know that something terrible is going to happen afterwards. Um, everybody knows that. Um, but what's interesting is the lead up to it and the, 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 uh, the dynamics, the institutional dynamics, the political dynamics, um, the relationship between the city and the Bank of England, between the Bank of England and the government. They, they, that's all fascinating. And that's, that's really what, what produces this um, actually, uh, you know, in the end, um, quite difficult outcome. Maybe we should really dive into the, the lead up to the murder because uh, as, as you wrote in the book, uh, by the end of the 70s, the Bank of England was this kind of microcosm of the UK. It had history, but it was also very confused about its own identity. There's a lot of inconsistencies, but by the two th early 2000s, it was already running a very clearly defined rule-based system uh, based around inflation target. Uh, and uh, you wrote how, you know, back in the late 70s and 80s, US and Europeans uh, debated a lot about monetary targeting. And then 80s, the, the, there was whole turmoil about exchange rate. In the 90s, uh, people started to adopt inflation targeting and there was a lot of influence coming from Alan Greenspan and so on. So we, maybe we should really trace out those different stages. Maybe we can start with uh, the very tumultuous year of 1979, because it seems that that was not just any year, but uh, a highly turbulent year uh, by by any account from from geopolitics to economics. Yeah. Um, no, I I, I I I mean that's right. I I, I think um, 1979 is a good year to start. Um, so internationally, indeed, it's uh, you know it begins early in the year with the Iranian Revolution and the overthrow of the Shah and a new oil shock uh, as a consequence. Um, so in the early 1970s, um, the first oil shock, the tripling of oil prices, uh, drove up inflation and um, uh, Western governments didn't really know how to react to it. Uh, so now it looks as if there's a repetition of that. Um, uh, then it's, it's also the year uh, that the US monetary policy really turns around and uh, so I, I think of 1979 as being absolutely crucial from that point of view. Uh, so the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the Fed has been politically bullied in the 1970s. Uh, Arthur Burns uh, was, was pushed around by Nixon. It's a very famous story. Um, uh, the uh, uh, Carter administration um, uh, nominates, uh, first of all, William Miller. Um, uh, then uh, there's a, uh, more uncertainty, uh, more inflation. Um, and uh, Paul Volcker comes in um, with a mission really to stabilize uh, the uh, monetary policy. And um, the policy that uh, you know, he, he, he used to describe, he's, 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 he wasn't a uh, doctrinaire Friedmanite, uh, but he, he described it as practical monetarism, and it reaches a dramatic high point in October 1979. That's that's the turning point when the, the Fed um, uh, starts to really tighten and um, move to a, a counterinflationary strategy. Um, and then in Britain, it's the uh, defeat of the Labour government, uh, the defeat of James Callaghan, um, and uh, the beginning of the uh, political administration of Mrs. Thatcher. And, and Mar Margaret Thatcher was somebody who took an intensively uh, a, a acute um, personal and uh, actually well informed uh, interest in monetary policy. Um, so she, I think, more than any 
British Prime Minister up to then, and you know, the only parallel is uh, Gordon Brown, uh, who was also very, very interested in, in monetary policy and clashed like Mrs. Thatcher did spectacularly with the Bank of England. So, you know, Thatcher, Volcker, uh, the Iranian revolution, in retrospect, um, you know, we also know uh, that it's the, the beginning of the opening of China and uh, Deng Xiaoping and um, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the beginning of China's influence on globalization. But, you know, that's something that I think nobody would have predicted in the early 1980s. But, you know, in retrospect, I think you can see the late 1970s as a kind of hinge moment. And so it's good to begin a book there. It, it was also really interesting because in the introductory chapter, uh, you, you, you wrote that the fundamental function of a central bank was the issue and control of money. In another, it was the management of a banking system that generated money through credit. Uh, there was a real problem lying behind the lack of statutory uh, clarity. No one really knew precisely what either money or a bank was. Maybe before we go into the events, we could also, it might be also be helpful to define what money and bank was back in both, both in, in terms of that historical context, what people thought they were back then, and also uh, how our knowledge of the definition of money and banking system evolved over time. Uh, what did people think back then? Well, um, that, uh, that, that's really a central point. And it's, it's one of the interesting themes of the story. And I think uh, part, of the, uh, part of the fascination of this exercise is, yes, I, I mean, it looks as if, um, on the on the face of it, um, you see inflation as being produced by too much money. So uh, th th there's a kind of simple version of the the quantity theory that um, had been spelled out in the 1920s. This is already Irving Fisher that uh, uh, mv equals pt, and um, uh, so. In normal circumstances, maybe we think velocity it doesn't change all that much. So money is going to have an impact on prices or an impact on the volume of transactions. Um, but when you get more precise about that, uh, that's exactly where the difficulties began. And uh, you know, part of the well-known story of trying to control the money supply is what exactly do you think you're controlling? And uh, there were uh, acute divisions about that. Uh, should you aim for a control of a rather narrowly conceived money supply? In other words, the banknotes in circulation and uh, coins were you know, relatively small, um, uh, but banknotes and uh, the reserves uh, that banks held at the Bank of England that amount to effectively to, to money because they can be converted into cash at any time. Um, is that the right way of thinking about it? Or do you want to think of money as um, something wider than that? So you know, then you get definitions of money that include um, uh, site deposits in, 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 uh, in, in banks. Um, but not term deposits, um, uh, not term deposits in non-bank institutions, of which the, the, in Britain there was a very big um, building society sector, the, the equivalent in the United States, the thrifts. Um, so how, how do you measure this? And um, one, one of the famous uh, stories of the 1980s, uh, the early 1980s, when there was this desperate control to uh, control the uh, the money supply is that um, a Bank of England economist, uh, Charles Goodhart, who you, you'll see comes up quite a lot in the book, um, produced uh, what is now known as Goodhart's law, uh, that whenever you try to control something, it starts to misbehave and the money growth occurs somewhere else. So, um, you know, it really relates really to the discussion of um, Milton Friedman and uh, Friedman's idea of a monetary rule. Um, you know, he'd worked uh, with Anna Schwartz on this monumental history of the United States, the monetary history of the United States. And they showed that, um, this was a book published in the uh, early 1960s, and uh, 
they pointed out that there was an absolutely stable demand function for money um, and uh, that that was quite stable until the 19, end of the 1960s. Um, but in the 1970s, uh, it's no longer stable. And so it looks as if simply taking one monetary aggregate is not going to really be enough to, uh, to, to control the inflationary process and that inflation occurs in bits and pieces of the economy where you don't really uh, see what's what's happening clearly. Um, and uh, you know that's that's I think part of the big shift uh, you know, one of the uh, aspects of the, that I try to document in the book is how the British government effectively and the bank um, effectively moved away from the idea of monetary targeting already by the middle of the 1980s. And so they, they abandoned that. And um, then they need to look for some other measure. And uh, in the end, and this was one of the uh, areas where uh, Ben Bernanke uh, distinguished himself in the early 1990s of uh, thinking about inflation targeting as a possible basis for a, a stable monetary policy regime. Um, well, that, that, that was where the Bank of England ended up as well. It was really interesting because you mentioned monetary targeting remained in place as part of the government's, uh, what is called the medium term financial strategy until 1997, actually, even though, as, as you said, actually, functionally, they had already been shifting away many years before that, uh, both through uh, the stabilization of exchange rate as one of the objectives and then inflation. But, but before that, I guess one quick question would be, uh, what kicked off this kind of uh, inability to, to control money? Was it because monetary targeting was fundamentally a somewhat flawed regime because you could never really calculate the monetary aggregates or M1 or M2, M3 very effectively? Or was it because a global financialization, the, the sort of liberalization of financial flows across border, which made it uh, more difficult? What was the reason that kicked off? Well, I, 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 there, there are two aspects of that, and I think you've mentioned both of them. Um, one is uh, that uh, there's a process of financial innovation going on, um, and uh, the uh, financial industry is utterly transformed in the course of the 80s and 90s. Um, and the second is that, as, as, as you said, uh, that uh, this is an era in which um, the controls that had existed before on capital movements are lifted. So it's, it's, it's another of the radical breaks that occurs in 1979. And uh, so there are possibilities of big movements in and out of the currency. Uh, could we talk a little bit more about uh, these two, uh, I guess, quote unquote, shadow targets? One is the st stabil stabilizing uh, exchange rates, the other is inflation. Uh, what was the exchange rate uh, mechanism? W uh, would you mind telling us a little bit more about that? Sure. sure. Uh, you, you know, and I think that, that probably demands some, some explanation uh, for an audience in the United States, uh, because the UK and the United States are significantly different in this respect. Uh, so in the United States, um, the dollar can move very, very abruptly against foreign currencies, and it doesn't really affect prices in the, in the US very much. Um, uh, I came to Princeton in 1986, uh, when the dollar was really close to its, uh, its absolute high peak against the uh, uh, British pound. Uh, so that, that, that was in early 1985. Um, and uh, you, you know, so my salary felt enormous by British terms when I moved there. And then the dollar depreciated quite rapidly for the um, rest of the 1980s um, after 1985. Um, but uh, the price of a six pack of imported beer from Europe remained absolutely constant. Um, the price of an imported German automobile remained absolutely constant. And so uh, domestic prices were 
barely affected by the change in the exchange rate. And uh, you know, economists spend a lot of time trying to explain that. Um, Britain is a smaller economy and uh, it's more open as a result. Uh, a bigger share of it is traded. Um, and uh, when the pound sinks, um, the price of French wine goes up uh, dramatically. Uh, you, you see import prices rising. Um, and so in that sense, it's, it's, it's a country in which the exchange rate is always going to play a larger role uh, than it does uh, for the United States. And indeed, you know, you, you, you kindly mentioned the European uh, book uh, on the European Monetary Union. You know, one of the ideas of the European Monetary Union um, is to make Europe more like the United States. Um, uh, so it's, it's less sensitive to shocks uh, from the rest of the world. It's, uh, it's, it's not going to react so much if the dollar euro rate uh, changes. So it's, it's, whereas if you're in a very small country, you know, you see the, the pass through immediately. And it seems that the exchange rate mechanism, uh, the, the ER, ERM, that's, the, that's the, the acronym for it, it didn't actually really work towards, towards the end where it didn't really function well. Uh, would you mind telling us a little bit more about the pivotal figures involved in th this debate about exchange rate? Because it does seem to be a, quite a fa fascinating one uh, mm -hmm. during that period of time. Yes. Um, well, uh, the, the, there are two real uh, parts of the story. One is uh, the, what's happening in Europe. Uh, one, the, the other, uh, what happens in the UK. Um, the Europeans at the end of the 1970s created an exchange rate mechanism in large part because of the story that we already thought about because the dollar was uh, sinking very rapidly in the late 70s. It looked as if the dollar wasn't a good anchor for an international currency regime anymore. And um, it's that that pushes the Europeans. Initially, the UK is part of the, that negotiation, then it drops out of it. Um, and so the Europeans revive a fixed exchange rate regime, but the idea is that it should be adjustable. And um, uh, there are repeated parity alterations in that mechanism uh, up to 1987. From 1987, it becomes more stable. Uh, it's difficult to imagine parity alterations after that, but the consequence of that is that it becomes really more inflexible and it, it's faced with a big problem after a, a really lopsided um, asymmetric shock from German unification in 1990 with big fiscal spending in Germany and then a monetary regime that tries to stop the inflationary consequences of that uh, larger fiscal deficit. And that, that sends the European monetary system into a series of crises between 92 and 93. And uh, the exit of the British pound is one of the spectacular moments of that in September 92. Uh, so th that's the European story. Uh, the, the British story is, uh, look, the dollar is, is doing these big fluctuations. Um, a lot of the trade is taking place in Europe. Uh, Britain is a member of the European community. And in practice in the late 1980s, uh, there was a period when the Treasury, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the equivalent of the Finance Minister, uh, it decides to uh, peg the British pound to the Deutschmark at the rate of three to one without even telling the Prime Minister. And um, you know, that, that's, that's an, a moment of, of, of great policy tension in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the British story. Um, it's not a great success um, and it produces a level of inflation um, uh, that uh, looks as if it's undoing some of the achievements of the stabilization of the early 1980s. Um, so uh, you know, they abandoned that, uh, that peg. Um, why do they move to the exchange rate mechanism in 1990? Um, uh, the, the, the idea was that they would get a grip on inflation again, that they would peg to a currency 
with a lower rate of inflation at a realistic exchange rate. Um, from Mrs. Thatcher's point of view, it's also an attractive move because in order to fight the inflation in the late 80s, uh, the bank with the treasury and the, in the end of that period, the treasury has to make the decision. Uh, they put up the interest rate, so the interest rates are going up. And um, Mrs. Thatcher thinks and is persuaded uh, in the end that this is the right way of thinking about it, um, that a membership of the European monetary system would permit a lowering of the interest rates. And that's politically important in Britain um, the, 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 for various reasons. The UK population is peculiarly sensitive to interest rates. A lot of people have, um, they, they, there's almost no fixed rate mortgages in the UK. Um, uh, they're, they're all uh, floating rate mortgages. And so the moment that the interest rates uh, go up, uh, your, your house becomes unaffordable. and. Uh, uh, you, you, you can't afford the mortgage anymore. Um, so M Mrs. Thatcher thought, uh, yeah, th th this was this was the right thing to do to uh, to go go over and um, uh, to get some anti-inflationary credibility, and at the same time uh, lower the level of interest rates. So that was the, the calculation. By 1992, um, it's impossible. Uh, the high rate of interest rates that are caused by needing to echo the German monetary policy in the European monetary system um, are straining the British economy. Uh, there's a severe recession. Um, the chancellor at the time, Norman Lamont, is trying to press the Germans to lower their interest rates. Um, the German uh, Bundesbank, the central bank, is really resistant. Um, and uh, says it won't accept political directions. Uh, Le Monde tries to talk to the government in Bonn, but uh, that doesn't, doesn't do anything. The Bundesbank is resistant. And uh, the markets lose confidence. And it's, it's a famous story of how George Soros um, and, and others, but uh, Soros is a critical player in this, attack the pound. And on the uh, Wednesday, the 16th of September, 1992, the pound crashes out of the European monetary system. Professor James, this is uh, my mistake. I should have asked you to kind of help us, uh, our listeners, to find a little bit more about the European monetary system and, and the exchange rate mechanism, just in case they're they're not too familiar with them. Uh, the, the exchange rate mechanism, as you um, you kind of already touched on a little bit. But, but would you mind telling us a little bit more about the genesis of the European um, monetary system and also th this idea of exchange rate mechanism? What, what exactly are, are those on a, on a very basic level? Uh, just in case our listeners have heard this is, um, uh, This is in uh, the system that was created in the late 70s. It's a fixed exchange rate regime. It's not a currency union at this point. Um, maybe at some point in the future, people hope that they will move into a currency union. Um, but uh, it means that the rate of the uh, German mark and the French franc are tied to each other and can move only within a certain band. Um, there's a wider band that's available for new entrants into the system. So um, Spain or Italy, operate in the late 80s on a wider band than uh, France or the Netherlands and uh, Germany do. Um, uh, but it, it, it's, in, it's in essence a European version of the system that the world had had um, in the 50s and 60s, the so-called Bretton Woods system or the power value system uh, where each currency is fixed in relation to the dollar. Um, and but you can change it, uh, but changing it requires a political discussion and a negotiation. Uh, uh, it's not left to the market uh, to affect the, the rate of exchange. And so, um, you know, then what happens if the market pushes you? Uh, so, you know, what happens when George Soros uh, sells a lot of pounds? Um, well, you know, then you drive the exchange rate down to the lower band and uh, at that point if you want to maintain the system you know there's no mechanism for stopping exchange rate transactions if you want to maintain the system the central banks have to intervene and so 
currency interventions are a really critical part of the operation of this system. Um, but they're going to be on somebody's account on the balance sheet of uh, some central bank. So this, the Bank of England spent a lot of money in September 92 on trying to defend the pound. One of the questions uh, was whether other European countries would do that. Um, so Germany makes it clear it, it doesn't think the exchange rate is correct. It won't defend the pound. Um, later in 93, that's politically very, very sensitive because the Bundesbank also won't defend the French franc. Um, so in essence, the central bank that's being attacked has to take the risk on its balance sheet uh, and accumulate, it, it, it sells its, its foreign currency reserves, so it sells dollars or it sells uh, Deutschmark um, in order to uh, uh, meet the, 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 the selling pressure. Um, but you, you can see uh, that there's a point where that's going to be exhausted. And um, yeah, that's what George Soros knew perfectly well. Um, that the, the Bank of England doesn't have an infinite reserve of foreign currency. Um, and, and so at some point, they can be tipped off uh, and then the pound will uh, fall in value. Um, then Soros can rebuy the pounds that he sold or borrowed um, at a cheaper rate and uh, he can uh, generate you know, this uh, famous um, spectacular profit of uh, it's meant to be one billion pounds in, in 1992, which he used then for a uh, sort of very, very substantial charitable work in uh, building up educational institutions in Eastern Europe, for instance. Uh, open society uh, mm -hmm. ideals by, by Soros. And he, Soros was very uh, skeptical uh, of the success of European Monetary Union, which we, we could discuss a bit later. But it was really interesting that uh, Americans really had a major influence on the way that the British monetary system was was set up or in a lot of their economic decisions because Alan Greenspan played a very pivotal role in convincing Thatcher to join the exchange rate uh, mechanism because it was uh, this idea of a spine theory, uh, uh, spine in the sense like it's gold standard, it's something uh, fundamental about this. It, maybe that's an idea we should really explore a bit, uh, how, how Greenspan influenced uh, the British system in, in, in that particular period of time and that concept. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think that's right. You, you know, the uh, United States under, under Volcker and then under Greenspan uh, looked like a model for how central banking should be run. And um, uh, uh, Mrs. Thatcher really admired uh, Greenspan. Um, the, 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 there's a nice anecdote. Of, she first met Greenspan in the mid-1970s uh, when she visited Washington as the newly elected leader of the opposition. She wasn't yet prime minister. And she sat uh, next to Greenspan at a dinner. And uh, her first question was, uh, why is it that we can't calculate M2 in Britain correctly? Um, it is a sort of great, great conversation opener. Um, uh, so uh, the, 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 she, she, she really listened to, 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 to Greenspan, but Greenspan, I think, everywhere had this tremendous stature. You know, he, he, he came into office as chair in, in uh, the Fed in 1987, just before the 87 crash, and he seemed to deal with the aftermath of it very, very effectively, very brilliantly. Um, and in the 1990s, I think, I mean, this is really more important than Mrs. Thatcher even, and... Uh, you know, listening to what uh, Greenspan thinks about the um, European monetary system and an analogy to the gold standard. In the 1990s, um, the, it was, it was, uh, until 1997, it was a conservative government. Um, the Labour Party was in opposition, but the chief Labour financial uh, spokesman, uh, Gordon Brown, and his advisor, Ed Balls, uh, traveled repeatedly to the United States and um, it, it, it basically thought of the legislation that they would enact when they became uh, the government um, after a new election 
uh, they, they thought very heavily about, uh, very seriously about the uh, way in which the Federal Reserve System was organized. And um, uh, you know, a lot of the idea of the independence, um, a specific monetary target, but then also uh, having to acknowledge the broader aims of government policy, including the maintenance of high levels of employment. So that, that, that kind of language recalls the 1977, uh, the Humphrey Hawkins legislation. It, it was really interesting that you brought up the name Ed Balls, uh, which pr probably would, would be unfamiliar to, to anybody. It was unfamiliar to me before I read your book, but he was this very uh, young, very Eurosceptic uh, Financial Times journalist who had spent some time at Harvard and, and studied uh, un under many famous economists in, in America. And it was, it was really interesting that after the uh, general elections defeat, um, of the, the conservatives by the Labour Party uh, that was revitalized by Tony Blair. And then when, when the Labour Party came, came along, they really had a big reform of the, of the central bank and moved that towards the direction of the Americans. And, and in some sense, you wrote, uh, they really wanted to move the American direction rather than a German or French direction. Uh, so so uh, maybe we could explore that a little bit. Why? Uh, what is the kind of the coordination and, and relationship between uh, Britain uh, Germany, France, uh, U.S. during those periods of times, that 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 made a lot of those British policymakers felt like compelled to go the American way. Um, well, uh, I, 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 I I don't think it it really um, requires a lot of explanation. In some ways, I mean, the United States is the world's largest economy, it's uh, dynamic, it's open, um, it looks uh, very well managed. Um, the 1990s story with the reduction of inflation, but also the reduction of government budget deficits, uh, effective fiscal coordination, it's, it's altogether a, it's a really impressive uh, performance. And then um, you know, by contrast, uh, and I, th I think this is one of the interesting aspects of the story as well, that is a little bit in the shadows, but uh, uh, that this is w one of the periods when there's an increasing mood of skepticism about what's happening in Europe, in London. And um, in the early 90s, when the Europeans had agreed on the principles of the monetary union at the Maastricht conference and grew up in the Treaty of Maastricht. Um, Britain gets an opt out from that. Um, uh, Gordon Brown had been a very, very fervent advocate of the stability framework that joining the European monetary system gave. He's very disappointed with the outcome of September 92 uh, so that's why he listens to Ed Balls. Um, but also people in the Bank of England, um, uh, Mervyn King, the future governor, uh, was one of the people who had to go in September 92 uh, to Bonn and Frankfurt to explain to the German government and then to the central bank why the pound was correctly valued when he knew that it wasn't. Um, and uh, you know, that soured him, I think, uh, uh, to everything to do with Europe. And he, he had a diagnosis that was common in the US at the time that the European Monetary Union was bound to be problematic and bound to be a failure. Um, and so you know, by the end of the 90s, there's a considerable skepticism in Britain about uh, the way that continental Europe is moving towards the monetary union. It's not that at that time anybody suggests that the UK should leave the European Union, uh, but they are skeptical about the monetary union and they want to stay on the, on the, on the sidelines of that, that uh, a dramatic um, monetary experiment. It was really interesting because you have this chapter, I think chapter 12, about the uh, title, You Cannot Be In and Out at the Same Time, because uh, Eddie George, who, I, uh, who uh, you termed to be a master communicator and, and a, a brilliant guy who uh, rose through the ranks to eventually become uh, the one leading the Bank of England, he pressed very hard uh, for a membership in the European Central Bank Council for, for the, the quote unquote, the outs, uh, including the UK. Uh, and this kind of participation would have really transformed the ECB governance and perhaps allowed a better balance 
uh, between the objectives of the currency union and uh, the objectives of the European Union as a whole, but it was very firmly resisted by the German Bundesbank president. Uh, so, so at the time, because they said you cannot be in and out at the, at the same time. But, but as you said, it seems that the British uh, policymakers at the time uh, were, were somewhat skeptical of this uh, European Monetary Union idea. Did, was that in some way uh, the first Brexit? Probably not, not the first Brexit per se, but uh, did, did, you, did you feel like back then that kind of decision or, or thinking was, was correct? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, this isn't uh, my invention. Um, I, I think many people have thought of September the 16th, 1992 as being a earlier version of Brexit. I mean, I think I mean, Brexit, uh, uh, maybe the first Brexit is um, in the 1530s uh, when the, uh, Henry VIII took the Church of England out of the uh, Church of Rome. And uh, it was also then part of the idea of making Britain or England uh, sovereign, uh, that you couldn't appeal to outside courts. So you know, that, it, it's, 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 it's pretty deeply baked into the uh, national system of political beliefs. Um, but the 1992 story is indeed, I mean, at first, the 16th of September looked like a big humiliation and a defeat for British policy, and people called it Black Wednesday. And then quite quickly, um, it looked like a policy opportunity of making a better uh, institutional framework, and uh, people called it White Wednesday instead of Black Wednesday. Um, and you know, I, I, th I think on the whole, the successful aftermath of September 1992 uh, did produce the idea that in many ways Britain is better off on its own, and so it it it, it, it kind of fosters a, a story or an explanation um, of why Britain uh, needn't be so closely associated with the uh, big continental European powers. Before we talk about, I guess the the real version of Brexit, maybe uh, I think one uh, another important theme I'd love to dive into your book. Uh, was the, the rise of inflation targeting. We, we haven't really talked about what, it, what, what exactly prompted this, uh, I would say even global shift to, to the inflation targeting regime mm -hmm. because uh, you, we did mention at the beginning uh, the, the thought that was dominant for a long time was Milton Friedman's monetarism, uh, this classical equation of MB equals to PY, the, the amount of money circulating in the economy uh, should equal to the real GDP or output. Uh, and, and that was kind of the way of looking at inflation. But then we gradually shifted to inflation targeting. Could you trace out that shift a little bit more for us? Sure. sure. Um, I, I, I mean, it's striking, actually, that um, you know, Ben Bernanke and another a number of other US economists um, uh, pushed quite seriously in the 1990s when, when uh, Bernanke was a professor in Princeton for inflation targeting, but the Fed was actually very slow in adopting the formal inflation target and only adopted it in 2012. Um, the, 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 the one place where it had been done as a concrete experiment was in New Zealand and um, the, the Bank of England uh, derived a substantial amount of the, you know, the need, you, you need to show that something has worked somewhere um, and there's not, not a completely crazy idea. So it's, it's uh, like treating New Zealand as a kind of test tube um, or a guinea pig or a canary. Um, so it, it, worked, it worked very well in New Zealand. Um, and then uh, the logic was that it would, it, it, it could be applied in the UK as well. So the UK was really the first big country that successfully applied inflation targeting. And it, 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 um, it already before 97 and before the transition to the independent Bank of England, it, it made a substantial policy difference. I would like to read this small paragraph in your book, which is really interesting. You said inflation targeting was successful in anchoring inflation expectations, but it was also no complete uh, panacea. It solved one problem, but created a new dilemma. A large monetary and credit expansion might occur without price inflation, but where monetary behavior was rather reflected directly, primarily uh, in asset prices and where in consequence, the development posed 
a potential threat to financial and more importantly, uh, more generally to economic stability. So uh, the, the discussion of financial stability raises the question of uh, the bank's attitude, uh, the Bank of England's attitude to the other banks. So uh, perhaps we could also talk a little bit about uh, the initial obstacles and dilemmas posed by inflation targeting and how it evolved. Well, the thought behind inflation targeting is, um, I, I, I think, a simple one, and initially, at least on the surface, an attractive one. Um, that is that if you have a stable uh, monetary growth and uh, stable level of inflation, um, financial agents will put that into their expectations um, and the result will be financial stability. And so, you know, this was the kind of consensus view. And, you know, given that there was a lot of monetary instability and a lot of financial instability in the 1970s and early 1980s, it looked like a plausible view. There was an alternative view, which was a uh, more heretical uh, minority view um, up to 2008, which was that if you have monetary stability um, and you, as a result of the sense of monetary stability, you push down um, interest rates, both nominal interest rates and real interest rates, you will increase the appetite for risk. And so you will actually drive financial bubbles. Um, and uh, you, you know this was this was not a mainstream view before 2008. After 2008, it has a lot of attractiveness, a lot of possibility, um, and uh, you know, that's I think also now uh, part of the reason that you have a sense that central banks have a responsibility to think about financial stability and can't just um, say we'll let a bubble develop and. You know, we know when to act because the moment that a, for instance, a real estate bubble or a stock price bubble, um, when it spills over into consumer demand and thus pushes up consumer prices, that's when you should act in the old vision of a central bank. Um, but, uh, you know, I think uh, the, the, the story of 2008 um, shows that the, the, the central banks need to think about the risks posed by big asset price developments. And as a consequence, you know, they, they didn't want to act against that necessarily with monetary policy, but they need a bigger set of uh, tools in, the, in their toolkit and they will uh, uh, set uh, capital ratios, leverage ratios and um, to try to try to try to use those those prudential measures in order to restrain uh, some really large uh, bubbles. Well, you 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 got those bubbles all over the world, but spectacularly in the UK, but also in in Spain, in Ireland, and the United States, of course. Yes, because as you said, the the credit booms and a lot of those bubbles, I mean, seem to have initially just been in the financial sector, but they could eventually spill over to the real economy and influence uh, welfare. Uh, it was really interesting because you also wrote about the Phillips, Phillips curve relationship because Phillips curve uh, usually says there's a trade-off between reducing unemployment and, and seeing higher inflation. Uh, and, and you said that we kind of realized that you cannot just keep pumping money into the financial system and, and chasing growth to reduce, uh, to, to reduce uh, unemployment. And uh, what, you wrote, which I thought was really fascinating, is that what mattered for economic behavior was the extent to which inflation was unanticipated. Thus, even the second order relationship was unsteady. Uh, and it was also unclear what duration was implied by short-term gains in employment and output, uh, one year or three more years and so on. So uh, I, I think this first order versus second order consequences and relationship is really fascinating because even in today's context, when, when people are saying, are we going to see inflation in 2021 after the $1.9 trillion stimulus package and Federal Reserve's quantitative easing, they're also talking about the unanticipation and the second order uh, relationships of inflation. So maybe we could uh, let you explain a little bit more about this concept. 
Yeah, I, 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 I mean, this, this, this isn't in any sense original to me. I mean, this was one yeah. of the great policy developments of the 1970s, uh, the, the realization that there wasn't a simple uh, Phillips curve trade-off, uh, but that it depended on the extent to which inflation was unanticipated. The moment that you built that into your framework of expectations, then you lost that effect completely. And so the, the consequence was that the Phillips curve became quite vertical in the 1970s, you could have higher levels of inflation uh, without really affecting output uh, or employment uh, substantially. Um, so uh, that, 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 that really was the, the, the big policy lesson of the 1970s, that you couldn't rely on inflation. Um, and um, you know, so the, the, the thought, I suppose, is uh, in today's circumstances, um, when inflation expectations are very well anchored, um, then a stimulus package is more effective or uh, produces a bigger growth in output because it doesn't immediately translate into, into, into wage claims and uh, wage demands. Um, we clearly, uh, you, know, you, you can see it in the in the, um, in the in the in the in the markets. The inflation expectations are rising slightly, but they're not at the moment in any way unanchored. Um, the question is, uh, you know, how long does that remain the case, and is it possible that inflation expectations get de-anchored again? And uh, some of the um, analogies, I think that some people are making really do look back to the 1970s and I think well you know also the, the political circumstances of it you know, in the 1970s in the US the story was very very heavily driven by Richard Nixon drawing a lesson from 1960 and um, in 1960 he'd been the vice president in the Eisenhower administration he was fighting the presidential election against John F Kennedy um, he thought that he lost the election because the Fed had tightened before 1960 and uh, produced a slight downturn. He was determined that that didn't happen again in uh, the 1970s. Uh, so um, he's, he's pushing for expansion before 1972. Um, and uh, we, we have something of that dynamic uh, at, the, at the moment that uh, we saw um, you know, first of all, uh, the, 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 the Trump uh, tax cuts um, produced a lot of stimulus that many people thought wasn't needed, but seems to have pushed the economy into a higher growth rate and into creating more jobs without creating uh, any more inflation expectations. So it looks very, it looks as if it was very successful. In, in, in retrospect, uh, you know, th this is happening again now. Um, you know, but it, by the time it's done a third time for you know, preparing for the midterm elections in 2022, that's now the, uh, already on the time horizon, uh, you know, by that time you begin to expect it. And so, so is this going to be translated back into expectations? Uh, that's surely the big policy question that everybody is thinking about at the moment. You recently wrote this Project Syndicate column uh, with Professor Marcus Brunemeyer and Jean-Pierre Landau, the authors of this book, uh, The Euro and, and the Battle of Ideas. Uh, three of you wrote that, uh, and I quote here, generally speaking, a one-off shock can be accommodated without long-lasting effects because everyone recognizes that this is an exceptional event. But when there are repeated cycles of shocks and policy responses, a pattern emerges, uh, people's views of the future start to change as the exceptional becomes normal. And that, in the language of central banks, expectations become unanchored. So as you said, Trump did it in 2017. We're doing it right now with the $1.9 trillion stimulus package. If we do it again in 2022, if we do it again, mm -hmm. then people's expectation of become, becomes unanchored. But so, so far, we're not seeing it uh, yet, I suppose. But, but it could uh, go bad. That's correct. But, but, but people start to think about this and start to debate it. And, you know, in, 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 in part, um, the, uh, you know, the story is, uh, again, learning from the past. 
um, that uh, many people in the Obama administration believed that the fiscal response to the global financial crisis had not been large enough, and that that was one of the one of one of the causes of a relatively weak recovery, um, and also of the poor showing of the. Um, the Democrats in the midterm election in 2010, when this, this, uh, they were the, this, what was the word, shellacking um, of the uh, of the, of, uh, the Obama administration, and so there's an absolute determination that that shouldn't occur again, and uh, that uh, that determination is really baked into politics. Um, but you know, when the markets reflect on that. Um, They, they, I think, uh, will 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 begin to wonder about the uh, degree to which we have a really clear exit strategy from an unusual amount of fiscal stimulus at a time in which the you know the output gap is is as far as we know and it's it, it's famously difficult to measure the output gap but um, is not as substantial is not nearly as substantial as in two thousand and eight and the the story of the origins of the recession. Are really quite different. They're not to do with a collapse of demand, uh, but to do with shutting down uh, the economy to deal with the uh, circumstances of the pandemic. Uh, well, the former uh, Treasury Secretary Larry Summers has been voicing a lot of his concerns on inflation after this 1.9 trillion stimulus package, and he was comparing back to the 60s with Lyndon B. Johnson and Nixon's times when uh, huge amounts of uh, stimulus was passed to stimulate the economy, and people thought it was. Uh, sort of the solution way out to, to lack of growth, lack of fundamental growth back then. And uh, somehow inflation just started again. So th we kind of just saw this dramatic on anchoring of the inflation expectations back then. Um, and, and I guess people are somewhat worried about it today. Uh, would, 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 would you say that's how, how you would characterize the situation? Well, um, you know, his, historically, uh, big moments of inflation have come with major conflicts with wars. Uh, so um, in, in the United States, the First World War, the Second World War, Vietnam. Um, in the UK, you can go back further and look at the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and in a sense, uh, dealing with uh, the COVID crisis is like a war. Uh, you need a complete mobilization of resources. It's, it's, uh, it's unusual and unexpected. Uh, challenge. Um, but it also has a kind of odd element. Uh, we're going to find it difficult, I think, to say at any one moment that the war is over. Um, there may be new variants of this virus emerging, there may be other pandemics, um, there will be a lot of rationale to keep up the wartime state of things. And it's in those post-war eras uh, that the debates occur about whether this is the moment to stabilize or whether we don't have such big challenges that we need to continue. I mean, you, you know, this is the, the background in the um, aftermath of the Second World War. Um, the, the Fed has to manage the interest rates in order to accommodate a large, really large uh, American public debt. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they want to get out of that, uh, but the, uh, the Truman administration says, it's a national emergency where we're facing a threat from the Soviet Union, uh, we're fighting a war in Korea, we don't want to do that. Um, and uh, you, you, you find it very, very difficult in those circumstances uh, to make that decision and to say, um, if you really want stability, you need to have an increase in interest rates that will make it more difficult to finance the government's debt. It seems that we're kind of in a self-fulfilling bubble because uh, it, it's very hard to define any clear exit strategies. I, I don't know how you define uh, exit strategies in your sense, because a lot of people are saying uh, quantitative easing, it's very hard to exit out of it. I mean, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet has just simply been blowing up since the 2008. And it was obviously a new policy measure back in 2008. But during COVID, we had to do it again. And it, now it's like, what, seven, eight, nine trillion dollars. And it's very hard to exit that. And uh, the Federal Reserve will always be there when market crashes. So uh, do you see that as a, as a sign of lack of exit policy or do you see something much more explicit to be 
uh, exit policy, meaning uh, if, if Biden or, or Powell come out to say, uh, we won't do uh, more stimulus packages after this, or we won't do more after, would that be a sign of exit policy? Uh, well, well, that wouldn't. Uh, it, um, it, 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 it would be a very difficult choice. Uh, we started off by talking about uh, Paul Volcker, um, but the Volcker shock um, then immediately had effects not just in the United States, but in the rest of the world. And uh, in particular, the Volcker shock um, really pushes up the cost of government borrowing for uh, uh, indebted countries, uh, emerging markets, particularly at that time in Latin America. And it, it it pushes Latin America into a debt crisis. And now we're in an environment where there's a lot of dollar debt, um, not just of uh, countries, but also of, of corporations. And so a change in the interest rate environment is, uh, is, 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 is very threatening. And people are worried about the spillovers. And I think you know, one of the reasons that Larry Summers takes such a strong position is that he's precisely concerned with those spillover effects, uh, the more you get yourself into the situation where the spillovers are so destructive, um, the more trapped you are in the policy. It's really interesting, Professor James, when uh, I believe two, three weeks ago, when you were giving your lunch talk about your newest book at the Julius Rabinowitz Center, uh, I asked you this question, which is where, where do you see things headed? Because uh, I, I said back in 1982, inflation, real inflation was seven to nine percent. Ten year treasury yield was at 13 percent. And, and today the, the yield, uh, there was some volatility, but now it's like 1.5, 1.6% and, and real inflation is really nowhere to be seen. Maybe we'll get 2% finally. But, but it seems that to think that we will stay in this low yield environment for another five to 10 years or even longer seems very irrational. But on the other hand, to think that things would get any better would also seem to be quite irrational because <laughs> why, would, why would things just suddenly start to get better? So, well, what are your thoughts on, on this, uh, where we're headed, basically? I, I think all you can do really is, uh, from the point of view of a historian, is to look at long-term trends. And it's, it's fascinating how people have become interested in these longer-term developments. But uh, you know, one of the movements over centuries, rather than over years or decades, has been the lowering of interest rates. Um, so, you know, this movement in the late 17th century uh, to make debt more credible. Um, but that's broken and interrupted uh, by periods of war. And um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, those are the moments when debt levels surge and when interest rates uh, surge again. And, uh, you know, as a consequence, um, you you uh, expect to find a debt crises afterwards. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I think it's very hard to um, to say that you know that, that this is the inevitable outcome. Um, but designing an exit strategy from this is uh, it's just a very difficult exercise, and the larger the debt level becomes the more difficult that exercise becomes too. Since we're talking about uh, historical analogies, you recently wrote a very brilliant piece uh, with a very provocative title, uh, Late Soviet America. It's on Project Syndicate, if any of our listeners are interested in reading it. And uh, a lot of people were talking about it and it was quoted and cited and by Neil Ferguson and many other historians and economists. Uh, what was the analogy you, make, you made there? What, what kind of states do you think America is currently in, uh, why the late Soviet? Um, so um, the, the, the specific analogy was that um, uh, the Soviet Union uh, was facing all kinds of challenges, um, but then uh, there was the nuclear reactor accident in Chernobyl. Um, and the response to that was spectacularly ineffective. And uh, the ineffective response uh, prompted a debate about how the government could do reform. Um, in doing reform, um, Mikhail Gorbachev 
trod on all kinds of toes, uh, raised all kinds of sensitivities, and made for greater fissures in, uh, in, 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 in Soviet life and in uh, Soviet politics. And I was writing that in the context of a really polarized uh, election uh, and the aftermath of the election and the contestation of the election results. Um, you know, I think it's, 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 it's possible uh, that effective and credible government policy will pull the country together again, but it's very, very difficult to overcome these periods of, of, uh, of division. And, um, you know, I think you're seeing in, in many countries, um, uh, fissures and uh, divisions and uh, the sense that politics in one part of the country just runs in a different way to politics in, uh, in, 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 in another area. And, um, um, so uh, and dealing with historical legacies, dealing with the legacy of, of uh, slavery and racism is, is another of those, those issues that, that polarizes Americans. So uh, I, 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 I was really looking at, at uh, that kind of, kind of uh, the, 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 the splitting of the United States, the fragmentation, political fragmentation of the United States. Um, you know, that, 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 that's another reason, incidentally, uh, why it's important to, 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 to get policies that pull people together. Uh, and you know, we, we've, we've seen in the past the wartime mobilizations do that, um, but they, 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 they also have their, their aftermath and their cost, and uh, we need to find a good way of managing that cost. It sounds like you're not very optimistic. Uh, I, I interview many people when they say uh, America has weathered through so many challenges and therefore I'm an inherent optimist. Uh, but since you're making this analogy with the late Soviet, does that mean? Uh, no, I, 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 I mean, I, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's necessarily uh, bound to uh, fragment. I, I, I mean, I, um, you, you know, I, th I think if you think of these moments of trauma and uh, testing like in the 1970s, you also find ways in which the world pulls together again, but um, uh, it's 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 a really complicated geopolitical situation. It's complicated the relationship with China, the relationship with Russia, the relationship with the European Union, um, and it it may be uh, that we we think we find as a result of the challenge of COVID, or we think of the challenge of the environment that we need to have effective ways of, of uh, uh, coordinating. Um, you know, human societies are, are, are quite ingenious and quite inventive. And uh, you, you, you can indeed think of past moments uh, when people pulled together and uh, when, um, you know, for, for instance, the, the aftermath of the, 18, uh, of the 1970s, um, the aftermath of the 1970s is actually an intensified phase of globalization, um, more global interchange, more capital moving, more goods moving, more people moving. Um, and, uh, but it was, a, it was a, a new world that was born out of a big, big crisis. Since we're on the topic of China, Russia, and globalization, uh, you sent me this uh, piece that will come out in, in foreign affairs uh, in, in a couple of months. Uh, I actually don't know the title or the subtitle of the article, but uh, it was about the globalization, slobalization, uh, deglobalization. Uh, would you mind telling us a little bit more about uh, that piece, some of the ideas? Well, I, I mean, the, the, the basic argument of the piece is that not every crisis leads to deglobalization. So I'd worked quite extensively about the Great Depression, um, and the Great Depression definitely ended a kind of globalization. And, prompted a world of nationalism or not, autarky and war and a really destructive vision. And what I tried to do in that piece was to pick out some other moments um, in the middle of the 19th century or in the 1970s again, uh, where uh, there's, uh, there's actually a crisis, uh, shortage of supply, uh, a mortality crisis in the 1840s. Um, that generates a productive response um, and an opening of uh, the 
of the world. Uh, the, the, the first wave of globalization really set in uh, after this fantastic uh, political, economic, social, demographic challenge in the 1840s. The world of the 1970s produced another wave of uh, global integration. Um, and it may be that uh, you know, thinking about the need for a short-term response to COVID and a longer-term response to climate change issues is indeed going to produce a new type of, of global coordination and a new globalization. And I suppose uh, in those periods, we could also see a lot of innovations. Uh, you get this kind of interruptions of those long-term trends. So uh, maybe we can be, be hopeful in, in that sense. Uh, yeah, indeed. I, I, I mean, it's, it's difficult at the beginning of it to see where the technology is going to push you. But uh, in, indeed, you know, both the aftermath of the middle of the 19th century and of the 1970s, we have a tremendous technical progress. And, uh, you know, I think we're, 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 we're seeing you just need to think about the vaccine. Um, it, it's, 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 it's a fantastic moment from the point of view of a technology that can be applied, not just to this particular disease, but to other diseases as well. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're really working on ways of making society healthier. And uh, it's, it's, it's clear that uh, there, there were really deep fissures. And, you know, one of the things we're understanding now is how deeply divided society was by health outcomes. Uh, we should be given more means to tackle those kind of issues. Uh, Professor James, you, you mentioned the uh, uh, globalization, trends of financialization after the 2008 financial crisis. I think maybe to kind of tie everything together, I, I would like to bring up one anecdote, which is I think the first time I, I, I really kind of met you in person was uh, uh, exactly what, around two years ago when, when Adam Tooze came to visit campus uh, uh, to talk about his book, Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the World. And I uh, remember uh, I, was I was interviewing him. He was probably the, the first five or first 10, ten guests I interviewed. And, and now we're around 1.30. So it's, it's been a long time since, since I did my interview with him. But uh, I remember he and I were going to the Princeton University bookstore and uh, you were at the a, a corner with another professor, I, maybe Mike Bordeaux or someone else, uh, were, were talking about um, a lot of those macro financial trends and uh, Professor Tooze was citing your work and, and he brought up this very interesting phenomenon, which is uh, what we really saw from the 2008 crisis was that mm -hmm. we, we had this financial binding across the Atlantic between the US and the, the Euro, uh, European markets and a lot of the, clash, the crashes uh, and clashes that really happened and unfolded it is because this uh binding of a uh, global bank's balance sheets that really led to the collapse and, and he was saying that maybe we could see another collapse uh, from hsbc you know the, the the which is a bank that binds europe and china hong kong and asia all together uh, so I, I guess to kind of piece all those global macro trends uh, together, I mean, I'm, I'm about to ask a very generic and general big picture question, is that where do you kind of see things headed? Uh, do, do you see uh, exacerbated a higher degree of financialization, integration, or, or are we kind of seeing a somewhat of a backlash? Because nowadays we have uh, pe people, especially from the left side, Bernie Sanders, AOC, Thomas Piketty, uh, you, you name it, who, who are vouching for higher taxations, uh, less degree of financialization, a, a kind of a populist sentiment against Wall Street. So maybe we can try to maybe piece some of those trends together. Well, there is a lot of financial innovation and um, it, it's, it's, it's not, um, I, I think, uh, actually limited or restricted to the rich industrial countries. So, um, you know, you can think about the financial ties in the North Atlantic, uh, but you know, in, in some ways, uh, what's been striking over the last uh, uh, years, um, you know, the global financial crisis was also, uh, it was the time that the iPhone uh, was introduced, 2008, uh, new payment systems using telephones, M-Pesa. Um, uh, we're thinking about ways in which money can be entirely transformed. Um, and uh, that financial innovation is not, I think, just uh, or not really mostly coming from the US or Europe. It's, it's coming uh, from, from Asia, it's coming from China. Um, it's coming from areas of the world where states are not particularly trusted and uh, 
uh, ex-Soviet republics and uh, in, 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 in South America and uh, people are looking for alternatives to that. Um, they're not going to find them in traditional currencies. Uh, th th that's where the financial innovation, and yes, I mean, it, it, it's, it's bound to be accompanied by some, uh, some turbulence and uh, bubbles, uh, but the, 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 the possibility for it making for better lives is actually quite considerable. So I, I, I'm fundamentally optim optimistic on that story. As we sort of gradually come to the end of this interview, perhaps to, to return to, to your book about modern central bank, uh, you really explained to us how the emergence of this idea of a modern central bank was it, it had a narrower and more limited set of tasks and functions. The objectives uh, became clearer to provide monetary economic stability to the country and um, the, the uh, policy tools used, or, or at least in terms of frameworks, also became more focused. Uh, its communications with the public became clearer. Uh, and, and we talked about all those ideas, I, I guess, to think about how modern banks gradually evolve in the future, especially in light of the COVID-19 crisis and also other calls for social justice and so on. There's a lot of calls for um, banks to uh, take on a more activist role to uh, uh, central banks addressing climate change or, or racial inequality and, and so on. Uh, what do you think of sort of the future trajectories, developments, goals that central banks could take on that, that wouldn't surprise you and that would surprise you? Well, uh, you know, yes, uh, I mean, we should think about uh, ways of promoting climate sustainability. We should think of ways of building uh, greater social justice. Uh, is that something that central banks uh, can do? Um, you know, I'm a bit more skeptical about that. Uh, the uh, uh, you know, those are those are public policy goals, and the the idea that we were talking about over the last hour and a half of delegating a specific function to a central bank is 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 really predicated on the idea that it's 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 a specific function. Um, if you want to do something to create stable money, uh, this is what you do. But uh, can you do lots of other things at the same time? You need to think of other institutions uh, to, to accomplish that. And um, uh, you, could, you, could you have central banks hosting exchanges for carbon permits? Yes, yes of course. I mean, that's, that's a, a feasible uh, view of what a central bank uh, does. But a central bank is not primarily there to think about um, the sustainability of the world's environment. That's a much bigger question and it needs a much bigger toolkit really to deal with it effectively. And Professor James, there's one other topic I would uh, be remiss if I, if I don't ask you about, which is modern monetary theory. Uh, you, I, 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 uh, I have talked to a lot of professors, both economists and economic historians, uh, and a lot of them say, oh, Tiger, you should go talk with Professor Harold James. He would be an expert to, to, to talk to you about uh, modern monetary theory. I was, I was in communication with Professor Albrecht uh, Richel, who, who is an economic historian at, at London School of Economics. And he was also emailing me saying you should really uh, ask Professor James thoughts on, on modern monetary theory. So uh, do you have any, what, what are your thoughts on, on this new type of framework uh, that uh, central banks should take on a more activist role? Uh, in the economy, addressing different issues, uh, government debts shouldn't uh, worry us as much, and, and so on. I, I, I think uh, it's, it's, it's a question that um, relates to one of the discussions that we were having um, you know, quite a time ago now uh, in, the, in this session um, about the peculiarity of the United States um, so monet modern monetary theory um, uh, has a, a basic intellectual model that assumes a closed uh, economy. Uh, you, you, you can't do this with an open economy. Um, if you, and, uh, you, you can read the Stephanie Kelton book on this. Um, if yeah, you, I, I if, have it here, if, by the way. <laughs> if, if, if you do this with 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 an open economy, you know, she says she says she's quite quite upfront about it, and uh, that's that's great, and that's honest. Um, 
she says, uh, you know, you can't have a fixed exchange rate regime. Um, you have to limit capital movements. Um, uh, you know, you, you might just try doing this in the United States. Um, I think it would be pretty ill-advised to, to do that in the United States. Um, but, you know, if you try doing it in um, Colombia or uh, uh, Uzbekistan, it would just be ridiculous. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, this is a theory that has a potential application perhaps in the United States, but only in thinking of the United States as a closed economy. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's really a sort of very nicely abstracted uh, theoretical model. Um, which collapses at the moment of thinking about its its links to the rest of the world. Uh, most of the economics professors I've talked to say it's not even a model. It has no framework. <laughs> uh, I, I think most uh, mainstream economists... I mean, it's a conceptual not... framework. Yes, yes. Um, I think we, we really talked about making modern central bank and um, it, the creation of it really occurred in you know late 20th century in response to a series of major shocks the inflationary shocks in the 1970s the external shocks for in, in uh, oil price increases the uh, financial liberalization globalization in the 80s and and so on and, and nowadays i feel like this book has become much more relevant especially out of the covid-19 shock and uh, the 2000 financial crisis shock so per perhaps professor james just to encapsulate a little bit well, we see the emergence of a completely new kind of central bank where, where much more different policy regimes uh, be beyond even what we just talked about or were, were imagined. Uh, what are the possibilities that, that something could emerge uh, dramatically different from, from what we're discussing? Uh, would that surprise you? Yeah. Well, I mean, it shouldn't surprise anybody who, uh, who, who looks at long-term historical processes that there are moments of big innovation and uh, yes, I mean, I think it's true to say that this particular kind of central bank was a creation of the late 20th century. Um, and uh, it's, you know, its role is going to change dramatically. You know, if you think, for instance, of the involvement of central banks in um, digital uh, currencies, uh, people are talking about digital central bank money, um, you know, that, 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 that's, that's a new area and uh, that would affect the rest of the banking system. Uh, do, 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 you, do you really need big banks in a world in which you have central bank digital coins? Uh, probably not. Um, so, you know, you, you would rethink finance, but you know, that wouldn't be a surprise. Uh, that's exactly what happens uh, regularly. Uh, and uh, it's driven by technical innovation. And this is a, this is a case uh, where technical innovation is driving uh, the the development. Um, I, I, I I wouldn't find it surprising if we found um, things that look like central banks that are no longer in a specific relationship to a government. It's really funny that uh, I think on March 15th, uh, there was this Bloomberg uh, column titled Build a Better Bitcoin. Yes, we can. And it was arguing that the Federal Reserve should build a better uh, cryptocurrency and so on. So maybe the, one of the takeaways from our interview is that we can build a better central bank even or, or, or in some way. But, but uh, setting that aside in the uh, tradition of our uh, podcast, because the name is Policy Punchline, we always ask at the very end to our guest, what would a punchline be? Uh, what would your punchline be for this show, our interview today, Professor James? I, I think you need to think about ways in which you remain connected with the rest of the world in the aftermath of big crises, um, that uh, closing yourself off is superficially attractive and immediate response but in the long term in the medium term even often in the short run it's quite destructive so the policy lesson is learn to open up that was a fascinating uh, I I conversation today professor james thank you so much for joining me Th and, thank and you tiger yeah, yeah of course. great to see you
Well, this concludes this episode of Policy Punch Science. That was my interview with Professor Harold James. Please go purchase his book on Amazon. It's also available in other formats. Making a Modern Central Bank, the Bank of England, 1979 to 2003. It's fascinating uh, economic and financial history if you're interested in. Uh, thank you so much for listening today. Please continue to follow us on policypunchline.com. Uh, we'll see you next time. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.